Welcome back to episode 10 of my Metal Gear Solid V Explained lecture series. I'm Ross Weaver, also known as Charles Weaver, in case you're wondering. You are at the right channel. Uh, this uh, 10th lecture will be going over Mission 20, Voices. I'm probably just going over it because Mission 21's got a little bit to talk about as well. So, But it might not be a shorter episode, we'll see. I've got a lot written down here in the notes and then... I filled all of the margins up with additional notes because <laughs> oh, there's just a lot going on in Mission 20. So let's just start with the basics. It's called Voices, and Snake is infiltrating Monoko Yanioka. Ocelot translates it for us, uh, the, dev the, the snake's mouth. Um... It's the distribution centers, uh, metaphorically, from our Peace Walker version of uh, the base. And we know the distribution platform was sort of like the equivalent of the support platform and how our support platform deals with a lot of, like, you know, sending you resupplies out in the field and stuff like that. And that's kind of what the, the distro platform was for, or the distro unit's function was for in Peace Walker. So here, though, we're not distributing, you know, crates of ammo and stuff like that through the sky with parachutes or picking up Fulton soldiers, we are distributing stuff through the snake's mouth, which means it's it's language itself that is the distribution, or the, the vector of distribution, I should say. And it's, it's kind of the words themselves that are the thing that are being uh, distributed. And that'll come up again later when we get to the Code Talker mission. He, t he has a little speech about words. Uh, but we're going to have to get into it here because it's just there's there's too much going on. So I've got a mission playthrough of this. It takes about 30 minutes, and it's an S rank and gets all the mission tasks. Um, it's on my other channel if you want to go check it out. If you do this mission, what I think is kind of like the proper scripted way to do it, you sneak through Monoko Yanioka Station, and ideally you don't get caught, and then at the other end of it, through the gate at the other side, there's a, a truck that's parked. And if you get there quick enough, you can beat the uh, the truck's driver is on down the road. He's working his way back towards the truck. When he gets there, he waits for a sec, and then he gets in the truck and drives it off. So I think, obviously, what you're meant to do is sneak through Minoko Yanioka and get in the back of the truck and wait there. The mission tasks for this mission uh, require you to kind of shadow this truck driver all the way through this whole region and listen to a series of conversations that he has with other soldiers. And once you listen to the, um, <clears throat> all of those and then the last one's finished, you can kind of actually get on with the mission. So if you're doing the all mission tasks run, you're kind of restricted by this other soldier. You can't... You can't cause him to alert. You know, you can't raise his suspicions really even. Um, you, I think you might be able to raise his suspicions and he goes back, but he's, he's kind of on a script, you know, and you don't want to interfere with his script. So, um, <clears throat> Now, this truck that you're supposed to get in the back of and deliver yourself to the next place in kind of, I think, calls back to Mission 16 and Trader's Caravan. The truck has the, the weaponized... Uh, or, or I should say, the, yeah, let's call it the weaponized parasite in the back, and that's that's kind of what you are in this mission, and that's kind of the point of this mission is to let you know that you are kind of the thing that's tied up in what all is going on here. Now you're really here on do, going to this place because, excuse me, after you've rescued the other boys at the mine, their leader Shabani is here. He was taken away from the other boys and separated and. Taking it in Gumba Industrial Zone, and we got to go get them. Now, so if there's five other boys that we rescued, and I said, you know, Fox was one of them, well, if you consider, like, I guess it'd be Mantis, Octopus, Raven, probably Vamp? Although, I, I keep thinking that maybe Vamp was also the older guy who was the leader, but that kind of doesn't make sense also. Uh, but the fifth one, instead of being Chico, could have also been Paws. Could have been Wolf, actually. Um, or the future Wolf. Um, because she and Chico are kind of interchangeable, right? 
And this guy in um back in mission whatever that was, eighteen, with the bum leg, he's only got the one bum leg. And you know we know Chico has both of his legs bolted. So there's a little bit of differences there that suggest that that might be pause, actually. And that Chico's the other one, the sixth one, who was separated. The leader of the boys. So maybe what happened was Chico was the leader of these these foxhound soldiers, uh, the other five, at first. And then after a series of fights with Snake, I'm guessing, he probably had to be separated from the rest. And they were also, like I said, probably used for experiments and stuff like that. Um... But I think eventually, uh, the, you know, probably something like loyalties came up, or something. You know, the, this method of control that Big Boss had over them probably started to break down. Actually, um, I think as they mutated, maybe and evolved themselves, and sort of like as they basically fought in battles and you know, sort of like literally lost parts of themselves and then regrew themselves. I think they would sort of go through some, you know. Um, personal changes that would maybe draw them away from what they had originally been intended to be by Big Boss's design. So, uh, now this also ties in with the English strain itself. Like the, like the weaponize, the weaponizing agent is kind of equated to the English strain here. Uh, the weaponizing agent that you find in the back of the truck. And so the English strain, the truck, and all this is being tied together kind of implies that Venom has the English strain. And Venom kind of is the one who's distributing this this stuff because he's Snake. But really, at first in this mission, we're, we're led to believe that Skullface is the one, but we'll get to it later. Skullface is the future version of who Venom Snake is, essentially. And that's like a symbolic truth. It's not like just it is it's, it is a literal truth, but the literal literal truth of that would be that Skullface here in the Phantom Pain is being played by Ishmael, who is old Fox, and the other literal truth is that Venom is being played by young Fox, who is Chico. Ricardo Valenciano Libre. I haven't actually said his full name. But uh so that's what's going on with the distribution and the English strain and the weaponizing agent. And the, and the child soldier, so you get in the back of the truck and you're shadowing this guy and you get to the next station. So, if that first station that we've snuck through is the snake's mouth and we've come into it from the outside, and I'll get to it later in close contact in mission 24, there's a lot of stuff that cross-references this, this location's meaning and what all is going on here at uh, Ngumba Industrial Zone. But um, essentially, we could consider that part of the base that's occupied by soldiers kind of like the inside of your mouth so just beneath that behind it would be like your vocal cords and that's kind of where you get in the truck and later on there's a an african peach right there in mission 24 that you've got to get as part of a mission task and it, i'm pretty sure that peach is standing in for what's growing off of fox's vocal cords the snake's vocal cords which is the vocal cord parasite which is a stand-in for all of these methods of parasite based control that cypher develops so <clears throat> the linguistic control and like i said the other controls are like sop fox die etc but the linguistic control itself also kind of refers to this broken bridge. Now the broken. Now we know when we're tailing this guy, so I'm getting ahead of it a little bit. But there's a broken bridge that's on the path, and uh, just to kind of mention it here, the broken bridge refers back to you know Virtuous Mission and the broken bridge event there, and also the broken bridge that happens at the end of Snake Eater with Volgan, which kind of is an inverse, um, or not maybe not an inverse, but like an evolution of it. Maybe is a better way of putting it. So, also, this whole mission's structure, well, you know what, let me back up for a sec. When you get to that, uh, so I was talking about how it's like you've gone into the throat and there's the vocal cords there. So if you stay in the truck and that's like the weaponizing agent, it's almost like you can imagine that truck, and you inside of it, it's almost like a pill that's been swallowed. Uh, and then you want to 
after you get to the next stop, the truck driver stops and gets out and has a conversation, and you have to spy on it. You also have an opportunity to sneak to a tent where an intel file is that shows you the whole path that this truck's about to take. And so usually I get out of the truck, sneak around, get into a good surveillance spot, listen to the conversation, and then go get the intel file. And in their conversation, they talk about this guy's kind of, this driver's kind of curious about what's going on. He's a new guy. Uh, he's not recognized by the other soldier who's at the, the station already. And uh, he's just transporting provisions. And he asks in this whole conversation if he should be worried about the bodies back at the station. And he's, and the other guy's like, oh, just stop asking questions. That kind of stuff happens in war all the time. Just do your job, basically. Um, don't pay attention to the man behind the curtain kind of stuff, you know. Um and so this guy's he's going to follow orders. You get the intel file. You you can get back in his truck if you want, but since the intel file shows you his path, it's usually smarter, I think, to just run on yourself to the next little station. And they've got a a little security guard post, a two-man post out there, kind of in the middle of nowhere. And there's a fence that restricts access. But there's also like a little path that leads over the fence around to the side just off to the side of it it's really easy to sneak around and you can literally watch the guy come up have the conversation and then sneak up and over while he's going through the doors and the, and the gate it's it's a little weird but you can think that this is this kind of relates what you're doing here to metal gear solid 2 you've gone in through the mouth you're doing a big shell basically a little microcosm of it and now you've gone down the throat, and you've gone to where the stomach is, essentially, I think. And you've sort of been processed there, and you've gotten the, the, the rest of the route planned out, which is sort of like going through the intestines. And so then I imagine around here is probably where the, it's like all the intestinal tract is, basically. Uh, the small and the large intestines this is what's happening after this. So I'm guessing essentially this this gate that's out in the middle of nowhere. You can think of it as like the gate between your stomach and your intestines. It's yeah, it's kind of kind of crazy. But that's why the broken bridge is right there. And also this whole journey into the the stomach area is kind of like you can think of how your intuition is like you know gut feelings come from your 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 stomach nerves and that whole area, and how this this soldier is depicted, this truck driver is depicted as being curious about things here. And, like, he's got this gut feeling that something's off, you know. And he'll be kind of vindicated later. But, uh, this truck driver is also just another external metaphor for Chico. So you could literally see everything in this mission. I've said before, you know, Quiet is Chico, and Zero is Chico, and blah, blah, blah. In this mission, really, it's almost like everything is Chico. This whole, this, you were inside Chico, and everything is just Chico. It's this is this is the Chico all the way down part, um, but it also it's it's really primarily it's snake is the symbol for exploring that, so it doesn't just stand for Chico. It could stand for George Sears. It could probably stand for Solid Snake in some ways. Um, you can maybe also say that later on it can, it stands for Raiden, uh, in, in the way that he's a snake. But we'll get back to that later. Okay, so in addition to this mission being similar in structure to Metal Gear Solid 2 as a whole, because you get crapped out at the end, spoiler alert, um, <laughs> explosively so, uh, what do we do here? We show up, let's just say like we know what's going on, we're not just looking at it in the level of the game where we're going to get Shabani, what do we know as the player that we're going to do here? Well, we're going to make our way to the industrial zone, go into the building, make contact with our target, Skullface, have a little conflict, and and then that that's that's kind of it. That right there is mission 30 yet again. It's the Skullface mission, which is also kind of mission 8 and mission 16. Um, 
you go, you find out Skullface's plan, you like go to the Intel platform and you get you get the Intel and you make contact with Skullface. So that's and you know, like I said, this Minoko Yanioka stands for the distro, but if you go on down, Ngumba Industrial Zone itself stands for the the mission support structure as it was it was called in Peace Walker's Day, which is really the Intel platform. That was where all the Intel stuff took place in Peace Walker's Day. So in Survive, Middle Gear Survive again, when you go to the second map, there's a first map that you start on that's kind of the Afghanistan map, and then you go to a second map at some point in the story via a wormhole, and this second map is in Africa, and you're, you have an FOB there that's like waiting for you that you start operating out of there, and this FOB has its home right in, in Goomba Industrial Zone at the Devil's House. It's as if... The building at the end of this whole thing, at the, the sort of like the hospital that's got all the bodies in it, as if that whole building hadn't been built yet, and there's just a foundation there of kind of like a little metal structure that's just for your FOB and some some little uh, oh, the little structures that you can build in that game. And then there's also in the background, Diamond Dog's Intel platform is just it looks like it's come through a wormhole out of the sky and crash there. And there's like some bridge structures leading down towards where the other building is and towards the tunnel. Which, it, that's a literal superimposition of the Intel platform on Ngumba Industrial Zone. So, this all lines up, if you go back to what I was saying about the tower, what are the Intel tapes we find in the tower, or the Intel we find in the tower and the tapes we find in the tower, one of them is the agent's recording. Skullface tortures a man and says at the very onset of the tape that he needed this place to listen to the things that people had to say. So he's in the Intel platform. When he's recording that tape, which this is how we know it's a fake tape and this is not Big Boss doing something back then, this is being recorded at Ngumba Industrial Zone where probably one of these people who was probably one of the mutineers that was caught and then punished by Skullface, because that's what I think all these bodies are, actually, are people who were part of Big Boss's whole mutiny, and they were caught and brought in, and then they were put through some kind of a rehabilitation program where they probably were forced to do all this stuff, and we'll get to it, but that's why Skullface says, you know, I accept your sorrow, your, your disgrace and your sorrow unto myself. The disgrace and the sorrow is the, well, this gets back to why did Big Boss mutiny at all? Is because he, he kind of didn't get over his own sorrow with the joy's death. So this is all coming from sorrow. Or really an inability to deal with sorrow. But Skullface can deal with sorrow. So he accepts it unto himself. So he's he's taking all these people who had mutinied and mutinied because of their own sorrow and their inability to get over it, and he's he's murdering them, yeah, but he's also taking their sorrow unto himself. And since we know they're all parasite people... This is not the end of their life, so to speak. This is just the end of one form of their life, one stage of their life. And then they're going to transform after he kills them, and they're going to become someone else. Yeah, morbid, crazy, kind of hellraiser -y stuff, you know? Um, but kind of cool, I think. So this agent's recording, you know, like I said, ties back in with all that other stuff. So just, if you want to go back and revisit those other missions 8 and 16 at this point and get ready for 30 y'all oh boy so this all gets into a bunch of other crazy stuff um since there's this focus on the throat and the, the vocal cords being the thing that produces this weapon of destruction there is a parallel to hindu mythology I love Hindu mythology. They have a great, great story of creation uh, that you should go read. But in that story of creation, essentially they were using a, a sort of a snake to churn up the, the waters of the primordial cosmic ocean. And doing that caused this foam to rise up to the top. And uh, this foam is like a poison. And not just like kind of poisonous, you know, not like something that's just going to seep into stuff and then it'll get diluted enough. No, this poison was akin to antimatter. 
It was something that would have destroyed all of existence. And so, what do we do? Well, Shiva, the god of destruction, sees this foam, and he's like, oh, that's going to destroy everything because he's the god of destruction. And so what does he do? He puts it in a bowl and he drinks it. And he holds it in his throat. And that's why his throat is blue. It turns his throat blue. He, he's, he's holding this poison of, you know, the, the sort of like the, the bad stuff that came out of creation in his throat. And also in, in a version of the story, when he drinks this stuff, his, his consort, his wife, sees this and is worried about his health because she's like, if he, that stuff hits his stomach, that might be a really bad thing. So she chokes him and, and helps him keep the, the stuff in his throat. That relates back to why quiet chokes you in the prologue, because quiet is kind of your consort and your Shiva. <laughs> so yeah. Um, careful what you say, essentially. You might, because once you say something, an arrow, or um, I'm sorry, a word spoken is like an arrow let loose. You can't just pull it back after it's gone, you know? That's, and that's, an, that's a Hindu thing. So, a uh, little fun story about Shiva. So, what is all, so why languages, though? Why the throat? Well, language is here. And language itself is kind of serving as a, a, its symbolism itself, right? What is language? What are words? Words kind of are dead, right? They don't really mean anything. We imbue them with meaning. And it's the connections we make between words that really are important. So words then are like symbols in that it's the connections we make with them that's important. So words really are symbols. When you say a word, a word is literally a symbol for the thing that you're thinking of, right? So... Language here is talking about really symbolism. And so that's why this mission is called Voices. When you hear a voice in your own head and you are internally monologuing, psychologically speaking, you're hearing voices, right? Those voices aren't really there. It's kind of a dissociative thing to have an ego and think to yourself. And speaking is tied into all of this too. And so your inner voice and your ego and ghost stories are all kind of tied together, right? Like, and this is, this is true especially for, for people who are schizophrenic or have multiple personalities or, uh, or dissociative in any way. Uh, you could have a voice, you know, like a hallucination in your own head. And that's, that's kind of what's going on here with the voices in the jungle. Is, uh, you can consider this as like deep down, even further past uh, once we get in, once we get past that gate, and we follow the guy around the corner and past the broken bridge. Um, also, there's an African wild dog down there that you have to um, fault in if you want to get all the mission tasks. And I think that kind of relates to the diamond dogs and the dog theme. Excuse me. And Africa being the place where Chico was kind of. Really, not Chico, but who he transformed into, where young Fox really first came into his own. Um, oh, and the wild thing, like I said, this uh, implying that he was he was kind of like out in the wild here. So, so if you haven't got it yet, Shabani is Chico. Shabani is like another just stand-in for like an externalization of Chico himself. Shabani is kind of like another Malak. And so all this stuff about languages and symbolism really is about, in the, in the terms of the game's narrative, it's about lore. Words are the lore of the game. What, what, what do you, when you think of the lore of Metal Gear, what is the constituent part? What makes the smallest part of lore is really, it's language. It's words that make up Metal Gear's lore. Um, there are actions, right? But like those actions are distilled as like words. We have to understand them through through sim symbolism and language and all that. So that's why Skullface is targeting language itself because by targeting language, he's targeting the lore of the game because he knows that Fox is kind of redacted from Metal Gear Solid's history 
and he's kind of sick of it. And he's like, I'm going to make my statement here, and it's going to be completely symbolic, and I'll never actually directly reference myself, and yet the truth will be told. That's kind of what's going on here. So in a way, his linguistic virus that he's making is kind of his own lore, actually. So my speaking it here is kind of spreading the disease, in a way. But the disease is not like a disease that you're going to get infected with and make you sick and kill you. It's a disease that's kind of like, uh, you know, how your body is host to a whole, ho a whole uh, array of microorganisms and stuff like that. And most of them actually help you. Most of them coexist with you. This would be just another one to add to the pile, basically. You know, sort of like how your gut bacteria work to help you to break stuff down. And how important that is to your health. So, yeah, that's a lot. Um, along the way, before you go through the tunnel, and the tunnel is the sphincter, okay? Get ready. We're going to go through it. Um, there's this tape in the last tent where you, have, you hear the last conversation. And it's the 204863 tape, the, the radio from the, the PT broadcast. And it's, it's specifically, it's the Swedish uh, broadcaster speaking the whole... Luden's call to arms thing is what I think of it as. You know, do you want to join us? Um, you, know, you can join us if you want. You have a chance, basically. A right to become one of us. And I think that refers to you know Fox himself, really, primarily. But also, like I said, it refers to Luden's and the parasite, the, the evolution of people becoming one with parasites and then becoming something sort of greater than that. I don't want to say better than, but just something more than that. Because it could be worse than that. It could be better and worse. So, anyways. Uh, do, 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 the, so, that Pete, so, yeah, it, insert PT commentary and lore here. There's a lot to say there, and I'm just, we don't have time. Um, so, why are the man on, so, the man on fire and Trettage are here, again, is more like external aspects of Venom's own traumatic past. Um, I'll get to it later, but the man on fire is kind of the embodiment of all the trauma that Big Boss gave to Chico, essentially. In many ways, the man on fire just straight up reenacts re what I think Chico remembers him doing. So, if Shabani's here at this devil's house, right, and what we're doing here later on with Skullface is a recontextualization. Well, there was probably something that really did happen here with with Big Boss and, and Chico and maybe some kind of conflict. And I think Chico, whatever form he had been in up to this point, was killed, essentially. Um, it's, it's kind of implied that he was grabbed by the throat by Big Boss and, and throttled and maybe even maybe even beheaded. It's, it's, it's gruesome stuff, but I think he's maybe beheaded because of PT's, uh, the, the PT teaser trailer that shows the hallway and then the two balls, and then one of them goes through the door, and when you look through the door, the ball is turned into Chico's head. Yeah. This, this place right here is kind of analogous to that hallway. Like, literally, when you walk through this place uh, inside the Devil's House in this mission... You're pretty much in PT. You're doing the loop. It's in reverse. It's mirrored, but you turn left, you turn left, and then you got to run back out, right? But uh, you could say going in is like you're you're going deeper into PT, and then you run back out because PT is like sort of like his you know his trauma. So that's why Shabani has this necklace. The necklace is of a lion and it just that relates to the, the I, I think of the lion as like that initial group of foxhound soldiers as like a pride of lions um maybe even one of them was named the pride maybe joy became the pride i don't know and uh but i think shabani being fox i think he was the leader essentially because he was probably shown as being the most capable in battle and uh, so we go and we, we meet Shabani, and Shabani begs us to kill him. 
Snake says, you know, your boys sent me, and he gets his knife out. Now, this knife is a very important symbol. It comes up in the prologue, and it comes up in a few other key places in the game, in cutscenes specifically. The knife is Fox's blade. It's the cutting blade. It's, um, it's kind of a, it's a big symbol, actually. That's why Venom allows himself to be stabbed with it. You could say in a way that Venom cutting Shabani's bonds here is analogous to Chico being cut from the narrative, actually. Because it's really strange, if you watch that scene, how it plays out, Shabani starts shaking and making a lot of noise, and Snake is absolutely silent. And it seems that Skullface doesn't hear him until until he does, and when Skullface hears him, he turns and looks and points his gun at him. Shabani is like instantly silent and just goes dead. It's 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 almost as if Shabani was trying to get Skullface's attention, and then once he's got Skullface's attention, he's he's chill again. <laughs> Little <shit. laughs> But anyways, so. Yeah, this mission task of shadowing the guy and doing all this stuff too, I wanted to say it kind of relates to the no traces element of this whole game and how what Skullface is doing is kind of erasing all of the traces of the mutiny. There's no traces of it left, really. Um, you could think, like, Skullface is literally kind of a snake eraser. And so that's why no traces is a thing, I think, in the Phantom Pain at all. And this shadowing aspect is, you know... Why we're seeing this all reproduced symbolically and not literally. And the last thing I guess to talk about is Fox Die and Skullface's words. I've already kind of talked about his words about how he accepts his, you know, his disgrace and sorrow unto himself, the guy he's talking to. And then he sees Snake and says, You burn with the rest of them. And he may be directly quoting something Big Boss said back then, because I'm guessing what happened was Big Boss was holding Chico here after separating him from the rest of his, his crew, after they had probably failed a few times in his eyes, and then he was probably already, Big Boss was probably already developing the drone soldiers, and I think he, he planned on t developing these drone units and then encasing them in his exoskeleton and then that being like his ultimate his ultimate new weapon to surpass metal gear that was what his idea of it was i think but uh i think ishmael was on the trail of all of this stuff and um since in the last mission he had picked up ocelot and i think that gave them intel on where big boss was operating out of and he goes there and he's and he finds probably Big Boss murdering Chico. He probably can't do anything to intervene because I, th I think Big Boss was kind of still on a rampage and kind of unstoppable. I think Fox was strong enough to fight Big Boss, but I think killing him was maybe a whole nother deal. Because, as I'll get into, Big Boss is probably extremely hard to kill. As good as Fox is, and is, you know, even with like his sword and everything, it probably would have been extremely tough because I think Big Boss is... Like I said, if your form is consistent and you take trauma and you don't totally lose your form, you kind of become stronger but also less human. And I think Big Boss had kept his form for a long time and had taken a lot of trauma. So I think that relates to Skullface's appearance as being less less human and more kind of Darth Vader-y, if you'll go with it, you know. Um, I think that's a way of like pointing at how the original Big Boss was probably even more monstrous than what we see Skullface as. In, in the way that the the torture and the other stuff that we hear that's a recontextualization is probably a less monstrous version of what was really going on back then. So Fox Die and Skullface's words are here really just as a way of covering up the past but also preserving references to it in, in symbolic form. Um, and I believe that's all I've got to say on Mission 20 Voices. Um, Mission 21 gets into the whole bigger shell game going on here and how Big Boss's scheme was, 
you know, bigger than just making these super soldiers and, and the exoskeletons and the skulls and the drones and all of that. He had like big global ambitions because I think he saw Zero as having a big global hold on everything. And this is what he was fight. This is what the original Big Boss was fighting against. I think Zero actually wasn't really ho- that hooked in with the entire globe's workings. And I think he was over kind of overstating his influence to Big Boss in the past. Or to Naked Snake in the past. Um, but we'll get more into that later. Yeah. That's Mission 20. Lecture 10. Hope you all have enjoyed. Peace.